Well, good evening, Brian, and welcome to the 21st Zoom meeting presented by the Lodge Hope of Karachi, number 337, here in the province of Fife and Kinross. I'm delighted to welcome you all along uh, this evening. Uh, looking out the windows, uh, the best place for us all to be is in front of our laptops, our iPads and our phones, listening to a fantastic presentation that we're about to hear from Brother Ian McIntosh, past Substitute Provincial Grand Master of the Provincial Grand Lodge of Forfarshire. However, before we get into the main part of the business this evening, Brian, can I remind you of the Grand Lodge of Scotland guidelines that our uh, videos must be kept on and I uh, need to see a name so we understand who you are and why you're here. Before we start this presentation this evening, Brian, I think it's only fitting that uh, we, we maybe take a, a, um, a few seconds and pause to think about the tragedy that's just happened in Beirut, Lebanon this evening. Uh, the District Grand Lodge of Lebanon have, over the last month or so, uh, been doing similar Zoom presentations about educational topics. And I just hope and pray that the Brem out there and their families are safe, but more importantly, that the country comes through uh, another tragic event as quickly as possible. Uh, so we'll just pause for a few seconds, Brem. Thank you for that, Brian. Brian, this evening, it's a great delight to again welcome back to the Lodge Hope of Karachi, Brother Ian McIntosh, who's no stranger to us. He's presented within the Lodge and he's already presented one of our Zoom lectures in this lockdown lecture series. Uh, this evening, however, I think will be of great interest to members of the Lodge because there is a historical connection uh, to the Lodge Hope of Karachi. And it, Without further ado, and less talking from me, i uh, hand the floor over to you, Brother Ian. Thank you, Gordon. Can everybody see this uh, presentation? It's not open yet, Ian. We can still see your desktop. Right, how's that? Nope, still desktop. <coughs> That's it now. Is that it now? Yeah. Right, good evening, brethren. I'm going to take you into the uh, Montrose Cousins of Robert Burns. Now, those of you who are familiar with the history of Robert Burns, you will know that he didn't start life as Robert Burns. Uh, his family name was Burness, B-U-R-N-E-S-S. -S, uh, and he takes his name from his, his father's side of the family, William Burness. So I'm actually going to take you into his world, take you back up the family line and uh, just go into the, the cousins of Robert Burns and what they did and what the uh, involvement they were in Freemasonry. So I'm going to show you, this is a very simplified uh, family line. So right at the top, I've taken it as far back as possible to a Walter Burness. Now in various places, they, they, they spell it with one S or two S's or None at all. But uh, I've taken it back to about 1615. Um, his son was James Burness, born in 1656, and married Mar Margaret Faulkner. Then there was Robert. And then if you follow the family line down there, you'll see that there's, there's three brothers there. Uh, William Burness, born 1111, 1721. He was the one who um, went down to Ayrshire and fathered Robert Burns. But I'm going to take you across to the, the family that was left behind, the oldest brother, uh, James Burness family. Uh, that's on the yellow side, on the left-hand side of the your screen as you look there. And I'm going to take you all the way down. Uh, the first son was always named James Burness. So I'm going to take you down that line and give you the story. Uh, first of all, I'm actually going to go across to the right-hand side to uh, Robert Burns' aunt and uncle, uh, Elspeth Burness and John Caird. But first of all, I'm going to take you to where William Burness and the family uh, were born, and that is up in the Merns, where they speak a strange dialect called the Doric. 
So it's a bit up between Stonehaven and Montrose. That's where William Burness was, was born, and that's where the, uh, the family started off. Uh, you can see it's sort of where I've got it highlighted there. So that's where William Burness was born, up in the Mearns. In a place called Glenbervie, it's a lovely wee place. It's, uh, it's farmland there. Uh, there were farmers. Uh, most of the uncles and the cousins uh, were farmers in that area. So that's looking at Glen Bervie. Uh, in the old graveyard at uh, Glen Bervie, we find this is where the resting place of Robert Burns's grandfather, great grandfather, uh, grandparents. Uh, this alcove that you see in the pictures there, that, they were sort of put round the graves by the local Burns Club uh, many years ago in the 1960s. So that is where um, the ancestors of Robert Burns all now lie, a very nice, quiet, tranquil little uh, graveyard in Glenbervie, in the village of Glenbervie, that is. So the inscriptions on the graveyard up there, and you see they had quite a... It's either, you know, one S or two S's, it's sort of chopped and changed. So these tombstones mark the graves of Robert Burns's ancestors. His great-grandfather, James Burness, uh, uh, farm at Brawlin Muir, died in 1743, his wife Margaret Falker, and his great-granduncle, William Burness, at Bob Jordan. That's another farm very close to uh, where they were. Uh, his wife, Christine uh, Fotheringham, and this was restored by the Glen Berry Burns Memorial Committee in 1968. So that's the inscription on where that alcove is. So here we have uh, James Burness, tenant at Brawl and Muir, died 23rd of January 1743, aged 87. Margaret Faulkner, who died at the age of 90. So for you, that period, that's quite good. That's, that's a long life that they had. Uh, the inscription there, at the bottom, and also we see that Thomas Burness served above, who departed the life aged 29 years. So that's the inscriptions on the gravestones in that alcove. So Robert Burns, Burness, the grandfather of Robert Burns. Uh, I haven't been able to find out the exact date of birth and death. Uh, originally a tenant of Upper Kinmouth Farm, in the Glenbervie area, so there was that's the same area that uh, I showed you in that picture. Uh, 1724 became the tenant of Clochna Hill Farm in the parish of Denotter. He and his sons Robert and William worked on the farm. They, along with the other local farmers, built the first schoolhouse and they provided for a teacher. So they, you know, they, this is what they were doing in the local area. 1740, severe financial problems from Brad crops, low prices and a late frost. This is towards the end of the Little Ice Age, uh, when Britain was still, and the Europe was still covered in uh, bad, uh, bad winters. About 1745, the financial problems forced him to give up, and he retired to a cottage in Denside with his three unmarried daughters. This is uh, down towards the coast. Now, as you go up the main uh, road, the 89, 85 up to Aberdeen, in a sort of a lay-by overlooking the old farm of Clochna Hill, which is still there, uh, this memorial cairn was erected by uh, the USA cousins of uh, Robert Burns, William Cool Anderson. So if you're going up towards Aberdeen on the dual carriageway, you'll see this in a lay-by overlooking Clochne Hill Farm. So this is where uh, William Burness was born. That's the father of Robert Burns. So going back to, we go down the, the yellow line, uh, sorry, the green line, um, yellow line, yes, sorry, first. James uh, Burness, born 1717. Uh, he left the farm quite early and moved to the Montrose area. Uh, so uh, his brother, William Burness, born 1721. First, they went down to Edinburgh along with uh, his brother Robert. Then uh, Robert went down to the south of England and then moved back to Scotland and died in Ayrshire on his uh, uh, nephew's farm. The aunt Elspeth was born in 1725 and he married, she married John Caird, 
and they lived in Montrose. So other members of the family, Margaret, Jean, George, Isabel and Mary, but I'm not going to go into, into them. So James Barnes, I'm, I'm sort of number of the knees, one, two, three, four and five. Uh, each of the oldest sons was named James. And when I was doing the genealogy of this, I was getting mixed up with the different James Burnesses, so I started numbering them. So born in 1717, born on the farm, married Anne Glegg, had four sons and four daughters. He moved to Montrose, became a merchant and town councillor in Montrose. Uh, so he is the uncle of Robert Burns. Uh, he didn't have a long life. He died at the age of 44 in 1761. I uh, haven't found him being a member of any uh, lodge or that up in the area. Now, I'm going to cross to the aunt, Elspeth Burness, because her husband, John Caird, was a Freemason. So we have Elspeth born in 1725, so she's the aunt to Robert Burns. Married John Caird, who was born in 1721. Caird himself was a member of Lodge Montrose Kilwinning, he joined in 1766, and he became a founder member of the new lodge in Montrose, St. Peter number 120, in 1769, and the founder junior warden of the lodge. And it's known that uh, he corresponded with uh, Gilbert Burns, so that's Robert Burns' uh, brother. Uh, so there was correspondence going back uh, between the two families, and as mentioned in a letter from Robert Burns of John Caird, going to stay with the family in Ayrshire for a couple of weeks. Now, I'm going to go down into the son now. So this is the first cousin of Robert Burns, uh, the son of the James Burns the first. And he changes his name, uh, the spelling, to double S. He later changes it back to one S, but this is uh, the first mention is in the double S. Born 1750, died 1837. So this is the first cousin to Robert Burns. He too was a teacher in Montrose, and then he trained as a writer, a writer to the signet, which is the solicitor in Montrose. He joined Lodge St. Peter in 1779 and became the master in 1791. And as I said, there was a lot of correspondence between the Montrose cousins and to the Ayrshire cousins, first to William uh, and then to his cousin Robert. So there's correspondence going back between Ayrshire and Montrose. So we'll have the contact between Robert Burns himself and his cousin up in Montrose, uh, 1783. Uh, Burns wrote to James on behalf of his father William, who was now becoming too ill. 1784, informing James that his uncle, William, had died. In 1784, Burns tells his cousin about the arrival of Presbytery Relief in Ayrshire. Uh, 1787, Burns, on his grand tour of Scotland, met his first cousin for the one and only time in Montrose at the Turco Head Inn. In 1789, Burns writes from Ellisland, tell his cousin about his farm and announcing his marriage to Jean Armour. So you can see all the time there's you know, correspondence going back, backwards and forwards between uh, Montrose and Ayrshire. So this is the connection uh, between his cousins. We find in 1796, Burns himself is appealing to James for financial help. James being a writer and quite well off uh, because he couldn't pay a tailor's account for £10 for his militia uniform. So he's asking his cousin to help him out. And this is what he writes to him. Oh, James, did you know the pride of my heart? You would feel doubly for me. Alas, I'm not used to beg. Forgive me for once more mentioning by return of post. Save me from the horrors of a jail. So this is what Burns writes to uh, James up in um, Montrose. James sent the money, but uh, it arrived too late, actually, because Burns died. Uh, so when he died, uh, James sent another £5 to Jean with an offer to take the young son, Robert, and educate the boy uh, with his own children up in Montrose. 
Jean, however, did not want to part with any of her children. She just lost her husband, so she didn't want to part with her children. James Burness, we find, becomes the first provincial grand secretary of Forfarshire. And uh, the provincial grand lodge of Forfarshire was formed in 1815. Uh, prior to that, they just had a provincial grand master who run the province on his own. So here in 1815, he actually uh, commissions his office bearers and actually forms uh, the Provincial Grand Lodge of Angus, then Forfarshire. Uh, it had a few different names right at the start. And some of the events that James Burness records in the first minute book, and he had a beautiful copper plate writing. 1815, this is the opening, the laying the foundation stone of Telford's New Harbour in Dundee. It is said that there was 15,000 people in attendance at the time, which is most of Dundee at the time. Also, he uh, talked about the Provincial Grand Lodge laying the foundation stone at the new ferry pier in Newport and Fife. So that was the start of the day ferries. Also, he wrote of the consecration of the lodge at St Andrew's Tar site, way up in Glen Esk in Angus. Beautiful copper plate writing. So he is, becomes the first uh, commissioned Provincial Grand Secretary of Forfarshire. Now, also, I want to bring into the story um, the Provincial Grand Master of Forfarshire at the time, who was the first Lord Palmuir. It's, it's known that he was friendly with James Burness. Uh, well, Montrose is not far from Brecon, where uh, Pam Muir had his main residence, and Pam Muir made him the first PG secretary. Also, Pam Muir was the acting Grand Master of Grand Lodge of Scotland, 1808 to 1810. This is during the term of the Prince Regent, who became George IV. He was Provincial Grand Master of Forfarshire for 50 years. Uh, it's the longest we've ever had a um, Provincial Grand Master. Uh, he was the second son of the 8th Earl of Dalhousie and brother to the 9th Earl of Dalhousie. Now, a few weeks ago, Gordon talked about the remembrance and the foundation of the Victoria Cross. His son became the second Lord Barmuir and inherited the title Earl of Dalhousie, Fox Mall Ramsey, and he was the one who was involved in the uh, foundation of the Victoria Cross. So it was his son who was involved with the Victoria Cross. Uh, we know he was, he was involved with Robert Burns, and we know that Burns uh, wrote an epigram to the Honourable William uh, Mall of Palmuir. And this is what Burns said about it. And, you know, <laughs> it was very, not very complimentary, I don't think. Thou fool in thy fate in towering, art proud when thy fate in this praise. Tis the pride of a thief's exhibition, and higher his pillory is raised. When Burns died, uh, he settled a pension of £60 per annum on Jean Harbour after Burns had died. Uh, William Knoll knew Burns when he was an officer uh, in the militia stationed down in, in Fries. So there's the connection between the malls of Palmuir, the Earls of Dalhousie, uh, and Robert Burns. Now I'm going down to the son of the first cousin. So this is first cousin once removed. James Burness, number three. Born 1780, died 1852. He was initiated in the Lodge St. Peter in 1799 and he changed his name back to the one S, Burness. Uh, he became provost of Montrose uh, for a few periods, 18, 18, 20 to 24 to 25. Right, was from Master of St. Peter for three times and served for 10 years. He had five sons who were all Freemasons of various lodges, mostly St. Peter's. Um, he too, like his father, became a writer, so that's the writer to the singer, a solicitor, and also owned property. He was known as a, a very good reforming provost of the town at the time. Um, married Elizabeth Legg, daughter of the ex-provost, and they had 10 children. So 
Of course, there was no TVs and central heating in those days. He lived in a house in the Bow Butts, uh, a house which still exists, actually, very dilapidated. It's a pity that Montrose is uh, allowing this connection to uh, the family of Robert Burns to become dilapidated. So I'm going to take you back to the family line now. So we have uh, down on the left hand side, you'll see James Burns, JP. So that's the provost. Now I'm going to go, there's his sons there. Uh, I'm going to go into some of the sons. Um, the oldest son was Dr. James Burness. Then there was Adam Burness, who became a writer, and Sir Alexander Burness. David Burness and Charles Burness. All were Freemasons. So I'm going to take you into the two brothers, which had a, quite a remarkable history. So these are first cousins twice removed, if you're looking at the genealogy of it. First of all, we'll look at Chevalier, Dr. James Burness, born 1801, uh, died 1862. And then also I'm going to look at Sir Alexander Burness, 1805 to 1841. Tremendous stories. We can, go, we can do a lecture on each of these. Uh, they went out to India. Uh, to become involved in the, the India at the time and the Freemasons in India. Now, early Freemasonry in India, like what we heard last week about Canada, uh, Freemasonry was taken out into India by the regiments. Uh, to start with, it was the English reg uh, regiments. 18, 1819, only one lodge in India at the time in the presidency of Bombay, and that was started by the 17th Dragoons. Uh, with Lodge 361 of the English Constitution. We read in 1822, six officers and one civilian entered into the Lodge. They then formed the Benevolent Lodge 746 in Pune. Then afterwards that moved to Bombay. Some of the members, high ranking um, uh, people in the East India Company, uh, Sir Charles Colville, who was Commander in Chief of the Bombay Army, General Sir John Malcolm, Governor of Bombay, and later Lieutenant Alexander Burness. Now, that's one of the Burness families that I'm going to go into. 1823, Lodge Orion in the West was formed from the military members of uh, 361, so that's from the 17th Dragoons. <coughs> Installed into the Bombay Horse Artillery at Pune, and at that time, only... Uh, that, that lodge was only accepting NCOs. Uh, the other lodges wouldn't accept NCOs at the time. They were only taking officers and that. So uh, Orion was the only one that was taking NCOs. However, in 1825, a number of them took advantage of the presence of another regiment, 20th of Foot of Pune, and they were in, initiated into the Minden Lodge 63, which was an Irish lodge. In 1827, along comes Lodge Perseverance 818. And this is the lodge. This was an English Constitution Lodge. So Dr. James Burness joined uh, this lodge in 1831, along with his younger brother, Charles Burness. So that is the history of the lodges in India with the regiments taking, uh, taking Freemasonry out. So James Burness, born in Montrose, 1801, died in 1862, the oldest son of the provost. So he was educated at Edinburgh University, well, at school in Montrose first, and then Edinburgh University, Guy's and St. Thomas. So he trained in surgery. He was a doctor. <coughs> he went out to India, 1821, to the province of Kutch. At the same time, on the same ship as his brother Alexander. They both went out together on the same ship, but once they landed in India, both of them went totally different uh, directions and totally different careers, and each made a name for himself. One uh, had a happy ending, the other, I'm afraid, did not. So this is where they, they go to, the province of Kutch, which is now part of Pakistan. So James Burness was appointed surgeon to the British residency in Kutch. He became, eventually became surgeon general 
to the army in India. So this is the time of the uh, East India Company. So they followed the British army into the province of Sindh. This is when the British influence, the uh, East India Company was expanding, taking over the principalities of India at the time, expanding the empire. He wrote about his visit to Sindh and a history of Kutch. And this was sort of published back in, uh, in Britain. <coughs> In 1833, due to illness, he travelled home via the very tourist route through India, the Middle East, Malta, Sicily, Naples, Rome, Geneva and Paris. He really took the, the tourist route back home to Britain. So he came back to Britain in 1833. Uh, he returned to Montrose. <coughs> He became a doctor of laws at Glasgow University. They were, they were showering uh, titles and everything on them at this time. A fellow of the Royal Society, fellow of the Royal College of Physicians in Edinburgh, and he was created a Knight of the Royal Hanoverian Guelphic Order by King William IV. This was a Hanoverian order, which gave him the, the ability to call himself Chevalier, which is a kind of a serdom. So that entitled, they used the title of Chevalier. <clears throat> so he's Masonic life now. As I said, he joined the Benevolent Lodge of the English Constitution. When he was back in Scotland, he was made an honorary member of St. Peter 120. He was also made a, non, a member of Lodge Canagate Co winning number two. And, and he was with a deputation of that lodge on the 7th of May when they entered James Hogg, the Ettrick Shepherd. He was made Master of Lord St. Peter in 1836, and in th the same year, made honorary member of Lodge No. 1, uh, Lodge of Edinburgh and Mary's Chapel. In 1836, he was appointed the Provincial Grand Master of Western Provinces of India by uh, George Lord Ramsay. Uh, this is the first provincial grand master to start establishing Scottish lodges. He was sent out by uh, Ramsay to start Scottish lodges in India when he went back to uh, India. So he's made this uh, provincial grand master. <coughs> in 1838, yeah, we find him convening the uh, Scottish provincial grand lodge under the, the constitution in India. The Provincial Grand Lodge of Western Provinces of India. He appointed his brother, Captain Alexander Burness, who was at that time envoy to Kabul as uh, one of the Grand Wardens. Uh, also another Provincial Grand Office bear at that time was his younger brother, Charles Burness, who was the Lieutenant in the 17th Native Infantry. December 1842, Lodge Perseverance was formed in Calcutta. Now at that time, Perseverance was an English lodge, but they were fed up with uh, uh, not getting any information from England. So they, 23 of their members moved across from the English constitution to the Scottish constitution uh, and Lodge uh, Perseverance was formed under the Scottish constitution. In 1843, Burness laid the foundation stone of a hospital in Bombay. And he was the first uh, man to establish the first lodge for the native gentlemen of India. Prior to that, the lodges were only accepting you know, Europeans or a push very, very rich Indian princes or Maharajas. Uh, they couldn't vouch for the uh, the normal Indian people at the time. So Burness established the first lodge for uh, Indians themselves. Uh, we find there was another hospital involved built in 1845, uh, endowed partly by the Gigi Boy family and partly by the East India Company. So uh, this is what Burness was uh, getting involved in, in laying foundation stones. Uh, we find that in 1842, he issued two warrants 
to new lodges in India at the time. He issued a warrant to a lodge in the province of Sindh in the city of Karachi, a lodge by the name of Hope. Now, where about that lodge is, I'm not too sure. Uh, in 27th of December 1842, Lodge Perseverance was formed in Bombay. Uh, as I said, this one was originally an English Constitution Lodge, but 32 members left the Constitution and formed into the Scottish Constitution. So there's the start of Lodge Hope in Karachi. Uh, another, uh, this is the, uh, the first lodge uh, that Burness uh, established in India for Indians themselves, uh, rising star of Western India. He established that in 1843, and he was the first master and re-elected in 1844. He also established Lord St. Andrews uh, in the east of Pune. So today, because of what he did out there, in India, he's still regarded as the father of Indian Freemasonry. So there's the, you know, a cousin of Robert Burns, a, a, a laddie from Montrose, who established uh, Freemasonry in India uh, for the native Indians and also established Scottish uh, Freemasonry uh, out in India and established those lots. Um, in 1849, due to illness, he decided to return to Scotland. 1849, when he embarked on the ship to leave India, a large group of troops, friends, admirers, and nearly every mason lined up to bid him farewell. The brethren of the Indian lodges held him in such regard and respect, and to thank him for all the work that he did in India in establishing Freemasonry, it was proposed to strike medals for the encouragement of learning and good conduct in three uh, institutions, the Grant Medical College in India, the Baikula Schools in India, and they selected a school in Scotland in his hometown of Montrose for one of these medals too. <coughs> this uh, became the Ducks Medal in Montrose Academy. So in Matro's museum, there's these uh, exhibits. One is the medallion, which he was given by a large rising star of Bombay, which uh, Barnes himself founded. And the Ducks Medal awarded annually to the Ducks of Montrose Academy. So it was one of the four awards uh, founded by the Masons of India. And that Ducks Medal is still competed for at Montrose Academy. In 2015, we were invited to the 200th anniversary of the uh, Montrose Academy, just to uh, uh, help with the celebrations and the connection between James Burness, the Ducks Medal and that. Uh, so the kids were quite interested in all these old guys and pennies and strange uh, regalia. Uh, the first picture is uh, they buried a, a new time capsule in the grounds of the school for digging up uh, in the future sometime. So this was, this was great for the, the Masons in Montrose and Forfarshire, being invited to the 200th anniversary uh, of Montrose Academy and to celebrate the connection between James Burness uh, and uh, the school there. Uh, James Burness is also connected with the revival of the, the Masonic Knights Templar. When he was back in uh, Scotland, before he went out to uh, India again, he was asked to sort of help revive the Knights Templar. Before that, uh, the, the encampments of Knights Templar were dying out. It was, it was disappearing, and he was asked to write something about the history of the Knights Templar and he came up with this book. He wrote this book, A Sketch of the History of the Knights Templar by James Burness. So he, with this book, he completely revived the, the Scottish Masonic Knights Templar in Scotland and that's why we have the Masonic Knights Templar in Scotland today, is because of this book that completely uh, revived the Knights Templar. The other picture I've got down here at the bottom on the bottom left hand side is one of the old charters we have in Dundee from 1812 of the first 
of the night's encampment in Dundee. So there's another sort of aspect about uh, a cousin of Robert Burns that revived the uh, Knights Templar. Now I'm going to turn to his cousin, uh, his uh, brother, his younger brother, who went off in a totally different path in India. So he left Montrose in 16 and 18, uh, age 16 and 1821. He became a cadet in the East India Company. He learned the Hindu, the Persian language. He learned all about the laws and the manner and the customs and religions of the area. He was fully into learning all about India and the whole region, uh, and he learned the languages totally. He rose through the ranks of the army and became an interpreter because he, he can uh, he can speak all these languages. He also became a great ex <coughs> explorer and surveyor of the Indus Valley, going into the Indus Valley and mapping that out, mapping the passes and ma mapping the uh, the pass across the Indus Valley. And he wanted to explore more of the unknown parts of the subcontinent itself. His great ambition was to travel in the footsteps of another great Alexander, Alexander the Great. Travel through Afghanistan to pa uh, Persia and Palestine. That was his great ambition. So here we have Alexander Burness, called Bukhara Burness because he, he went through Afghanistan, he traveled all the way through Afghanistan. This, sorry, I'm going back a bit. So he, this, this is a time when there was two great empires vying for control of the subcontinent. You had the British East India Company slowly taking over India at the time. But to, to the north, you had another great empire, uh, the Imperial Russian Empire, pressing down on the, the Hindu Kush. Uh, the British wanted to know what sort of influence uh, the Russians were having in this sort of buffer state between India and the Hindu Kush, and that country was called Afghanistan. So the want, British wanted to know what sort of influence the Russians were having in Afghanistan at the time. So Alexander Burness, because he could dress like the Indians, he could speak with the Indians, he knew the customs and the uh, religions of the time, they chose Alexander Burness to go into Afghanistan to find out what was going on, to make contacts. Uh, and this to, you know, as an intelligence gathering expedition and to use a, a story that he was traveling in the footsteps of Alexander the Great. And of course, he had this magic name for that part of, it, of uh, uh, India, Alexander Secunder, uh, the name of the great Alexander the Great. So in 1832, he crossed the Indus into Afghanistan to a reconnoitre the place, to travel through there and down into the Mediterranean. He found Kabul truly a paradise. He made friends with the local chiefs. He travelled to the uh, fabled cities of the, age, uh, the era, uh, Balkh, Bukhara, Samarkand, uh, making contacts, finding out what the Russians were up to. And then he travelled down through Persia and um, into the Caspian, and Black Seas and down into the Mediterranean. So the British East India Company used Bacara Burns. It was called Bacara Burns because he, he, he wrote a, a, a book about what life was like in this uh, fabled city of Bacara in Afghanistan. So when it was published in Britain, he was given this name Bacara Burns. This is a time, as I say, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of spying and intrigue going on between the British and Russia at the time. Sorry. So he became part of what was called the Great Game, uh, something made famous by Roger Kipling, uh, this great game of spying and espionage. But this was like the James Bond of the era. Uh, uh, he became involved with this. Uh, those of you who have read Rudyard Kipler's Kim, book on Kim, 
a story about a little boy who sort of uh, becomes embroiled in the, the spying the Russians up in the uh, uh, the mountains. So he was trying. He was uh, involved in this great game between uh, Tsarist Russia and the British, and in between you had uh, Afghanistan. So he was involved with this great game. So this to sort of the British were sort of really worried about the influence that the Russians had in Afghanistan at the time. Uh, so they wanted to sort of establish trade relationships with Kabul. So just to help things along, uh, a lot, just to help things along with this trade mission, uh, the British also sent an army of 36,000 just to make sure the Afghanistans had uh, signed on the dotted line. Uh, the army at that time was mostly Indian uh, troops uh, led by uh, British officers. So in 1839, the British sent an army into Afghanistan. Um, Burness had made friends with the, the chief there in, in Kabul, but the local uh, British commanders didn't like him, and they replaced him with a rival. The Afghans didn't like this. They rose up in revolt. And one of the persons that they blamed for bringing the British and the British army into Afghanistan was Alexander Burness. He had a house in Kabul and he was staying there along with his younger brother Charles. Uh, the Afghans surrounded his house and they stormed it and Alexander Burness and his young brother were killed uh, in the first Anglo-Afghan War of 1841. The British army were forced to retreat from Kabul uh, there's two passes out of Afghanistan. One is the Khyber Pass in the south. The other one in the north, not far from Kabul, is the Bolan Pass. The entire army was trapped in the Bolan Pass and wiped out. The entire British army, uh, mostly India, Indian troops, was wiped out. They only allowed one survivor, a doctor, to escape to tell the story of what happens when the British go into Afghanistan. And he managed to take the story back and reach the British fort at Jalalabad. So that is what started the first Anglo-Afghan War in 1841. It was a period too which brought down the, the East India Company and uh, the India was then taken over by the British government to rule India. Now, Sorry, I, I don't know why this is going like this. Uh, his Masonic background. <clears throat> we know that Alexander Burness joined uh, an English lodge, the Benevolent Lodge, 146 in Bombay, sometime between 28 and 34. Uh, he was also made an honorary member of St. Peter and Montrose in 1834. And as I said before, he was involved by his brother uh, as one of the wardens in the, the, uh, the forming of the uh, Grand Lodge of Western India. We find that some of the, the exploits that Burness got up to uh, during his uh, passage through Afghanistan were incorporated by George MacDonald Fraser in the Fa Flashman novels. And other sort of writers sort of used some of uh, Burness's exploits in Afghanistan. We can say an awful lot by Bukhara Burns because there's an entire, there's an entire book been written about Alexander Burness. So there's a massive story. Uh, he wrote about his travels to this fabled city called Bukhara and he published this. His journals and his diaries are in the uh, museum at Montrose. And this is why he got the name Bukhara Burns because he wrote of his travels in Bukhara. So that's Bukhara Burns. That's him dressed as an Indian. Um, when he went through there. Now I'm going to sort of finish now because uh, the reason why we got the journals and the documents and all these diaries back in Montrose was because of this man, Mohan Lal. He was the great friend of Bukhara Burns. He was his, uh, his secretary, his companion. He went with Burness and all his travels. Uh, so when things had settled down 
after Burness had been killed and they'd left the house, he went back into the house and he rescued all the documents, the diaries, the journals, and he traveled all the way from India to Montrose in Scotland to hand the books back to the family. And that is why all these documents are still in Montrose uh, Museum. Now, Mohan Lal, way back in 1841, sort of made this comment at the bottom here, which I think still holds good for today especially about the involvement of Western nations in Afghanistan. He said in 1841, you all tell yourselves all sorts of fairy stories. You are here to sell us your wonderful British goods. You want to set us free to grow up, to educate us, to make us worship three gods instead of 40,000. But when you are old and tired and sleeping, in a thousand years, you will realize that you came here and took possession of what was not yours. So that's the thoughts of a, a, a Muslim who accompanied the caravans through there and just, you know, telling uh, Western nations what it's like still applies today, I think. So that, brethren, is the story of the cousins, the Montrose cousins of Robert Burns uh, and their lives down to uh, the middle of the 19th century, and especially the exploits of two like James Burness and Alexander Burness. There's lectures on these brethren alone. Uh, there's plenty of material there to tell you all about it. So I think that, that's it for tonight, brethren, and thank you very much for listening. Ian, on behalf of the members of the Lodge Hope of Karachi, number 337, and all our visitors here this evening, can I once again thank you for the research, the endeavours that you've put in to bring us this wonderful presentation. I think particularly fitting as again you've presented to the Lodge Hope of Karachi and yes we're very proud of our 177 year history albeit we had a bit of a gap from the early 1970s through to the late 80s when we were reponed here in the province of Fife and Kinross. But I do know that our honorary member Bommy Mehta is very proud that the Lodge Hope of Karachi is still thriving and that he views us as number one on the role of the Scottish Lodges over in India. Uh, and I just hope that the, the words of uh, Burness within the Ducks Medals up in Montrose, the encouragement of learning is something that we are continuing to do today in 2020 at the Lodge Hope of Karachi just have a look Ian to see if we've got any questions for you in the chat room uh, so the first comment uh, from uh, Dr Douglas Nicol the Provincial Grand Master up in Aberdeenshire uh, I believe Dr James Burness was also created a baron by Ernst II of Saxe Coburg Gotha what was it about him that led him to receiving all these honours I think it was just the the, the, the story he, he sort of he, he wrote about his travels into Sindh, into the province of Kutch. Um, probably, I didn't know he was sort of created a baron, uh, Douglas. But yeah, he, he was when he when he came back from uh, uh, India that first time, and he was made members of uh, Canning Gate Kill Winning and Mary's Chaplain. Uh, created uh, a fellow of the Royal Society and all that. I think they were just pouring um, honours on him at the time. Um, yeah, but I didn't know about the, the barony of... Uh, but of course, you know, that's all part of the Hanoverian dynasty, isn't it? There's a, another comment, uh, out with all the fantastic plaudits coming your way, Ian. There's a comment from Jim Gardner. Uh, the Chevel Ian Chevel. Oh, somebody just put a big comment there. It disappeared off my screen. Uh, Chevalier was made honorary member of 120 in 1834. Then master two years later. Did he affiliate? Yes, yes, he affiliated before. Um, when he when he came back to Montrose, he was affiliated in the lodge because that was his father's lodge and that was his brother's lodge. So he affiliated to the lodge, and then very soon after that, he was created master of the lodge. 
Uh, Mike Kearns helpfully put up the details from Lane's Masonic Records in the chat about Lodge Perseverance Number 818 English Constitution. Uh, and again, Brian, if you do want to have a look at Lane's uh, records, just Google them, a huge amount of information. I, Douglas Nicol again, well done Ian, excellent lecture. Another thing that should be noted is the British Army was actually the army of the East India Company until yeah. the company was taken over by the British government. Yeah, that happened in 1841 with this debacle in Afghanistan with the Anglo-Afghan War. Uh, the British government then uh, took over the government of India. So before that, it was the, the army of the East India Company, the Bombay Army. Uh, a comment uh, and a question from Ian Woch for you, Ian. Uh, congratulations again, Ian. Excellent. You referred to how many various members of the family changed the spelling of their surname. Do we know how this was done? Was it actioned officially, uh, brackets, by deed poll, or did they just alter the, the way they signed their name? They just altered the way they signed their name. There's nothing like, you know, official... Uh, <clears throat> way of sort of changing the name. They just sort of did it. Yeah, and that, that's so backed up by Stevie Chalmers' phonetic spelling, like yeah. in so many yeah. documents. Yeah, yeah. See, so the 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 comment that I'd like to, to give Ian is to you as well. There is another province here in the province of Fife and Kinross. Some say it's the jewel uh, because it's the only lodge in Kinross. Uh, but one of their past masters is a Burness, and local legend has it that he is a, a family connection as well. Uh, but I'm sure if Drew Simpson was here, he would be able to regale us with the, the full story uh, mm. of that member of the family as well. So if there's no further questions, Brian, I would just once again like to congratulate Ian and all his endeavours and thank him, for, thank him once again for coming to speak to the Lodge Hope of Karachi this evening. Brian, next week uh, I'm delighted to announce that I've managed to persuade my worshipful brother Brendan Kine to join us. Now, what's special about Brendan, he will be joining us at 4 a.m. his time, as he's the Secretary of the Australia New Zealand Masonic Research Council. So he's going to get up very early, so I think it's the very least that we can do is try to get a good number for him and hopefully get a full house next week to listen to Brendan, who's going to tell us the story of the development of Freemasonry in Australia. And I'm sure many of us have got family relations down there. Uh, some of you uh, maybe were, were on the boat and you managed to come back after you did your service uh, down there uh, many moons ago. Uh, Alistair Marshall. Uh, hey. <laughs> but I think if we can get a good support for that, that would be really appreciated, Brian. Uh, Ian mentioned uh, Fox Mall Ramsey uh, and the Victoria Cross. And with the Lodge's blessing, and we've got a committee meeting uh, later on this week, we are proposing to hold a, a special lockdown lecture, and that will be on Sunday, uh, the 16th of August, and it will be to commemorate the ending of the Second World War uh, with VJ Day on the Saturday. And I, I've pulled together a, a presentation uh, of the history of the Victoria Cross and its connection to Freemasonry and go into some of the stories of some of the, the recipients who have received our highest award. Uh, I will advertise that, Brian, but uh, it's the Lodge's way to commemorate the secessions of the Second World War. Uh, once again, Brian, can I thank you for attending on behalf of the Lodge Hope of Karachi. Can I encourage you to sign the virtual tile and for <coughs> you to join us uh, within the Facebook pages later on this evening where no doubt the conversation will continue. Uh, I will unmute you all now so you can say your thank yous and your good nights to, to Brother Ian and to each other. And I will give you the normal five second countdown before I stop recording and say the final good night. So Brian, thank you all once again. You're now unmuted. <laughs> and you can say goodbye.
Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks, Ian. That was brilliant. Thanks, Thanks. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. We'll organise Gordon again. Great presentation. Thank, Thank, Thank you, much. Gordon, for arranging. Well done, Ian. Thank I really enjoyed the lecture tonight. Most enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you Good very night. much. Thank you. Yeah, that was absolutely super. Thank you very much. And thank you again for Gordon for keeping this going and running it all. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you, brother Ian, for the very interesting talk. Thank you, Gordon, for organising it. Well done, Ian. Well done, Gordon. Cheers, Ryan. Good evening, all. Well done, Ian. Excellent. Thank you, Gordon, and thank you, Ian, and another excellent evening tonight. Thank you. Okay, Brian, I'm going to give you five, I, but before I do so, I'll remind you this will be on the Lodge Hope of Karachi's YouTube channel, and it will be available for you to view, uh, hopefully by around 10 o'clock this evening. That's five, four, three, two, one, thank you, and good night.